Good morning. Good morning, G. Good morning, everyone. We are gathered today in the presence of a majestic God, a great God, an awesome God. And he's not ashamed to call us his own. You belong to God. I belong to God. It doesn't matter who we are, what we have done, what we belong to God. And his arms are outstretched to embrace us. Can we stand up today for our Psalms? Today we'll be doing Psalm 8. Oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength. Their little voices silence your enemies and all the little when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about us? What are human beings that you should care for us? Yes, you made us only a little lower than God. You crowned us with glory and honor. You gave us charge of everything you made. Putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds. All my animals. The birds in the sky, the fish in the sea. Everything that swims the ocean currents. Together, let's proclaim. O oh Lord, our Lord, your Lord majestic name fills the earth. Amen. So, Sister Kay, can you come for the doxology? <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, my heavenly Lord. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. I would invite 
Are we doing the opening song? Yeah, I was coming up. And invite <laughs> our the rest of our choir. And remember, this thing is open. You can become a member of this choir even right now. Okay. Holy, holy, holy. Love holy, 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 Round, <laughs> Holy, 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 Let us pray. Oh, holy God, you made the seas and shaped the land. You set the planets spinning and scattered the stars throughout the skies. Even when the earth shakes and the oceans roar, you remain steadfast, calming our fears and quieting our storms. We give all thanks and praise to you, O oh God, now and forever. Amen. Hey, right, a few announcements. Uh, we had breakfast this morning. I understand it was sausage gravy and biscuits and scrambled eggs. Sorry if you missed out. Um, but if you come next week, 
who knows what we'll have. 9.15-ish is the beginning time. Um, and uh, I did see some to-go lunches down there. I have no idea what's in them, but I saw some bags, and I assumed they were to-go lunches. If you'd like to take some to-go lunches for you, your neighbor, or just someone out on the sidewalk, feel free. Just go downstairs after uh, worship, and they will be there. You can keep up to date with uh, what goes on in this corner of Dayton by going to eastdaytonfellowship.org. And at the top, if you hit calendar, it'll show you what's going on this week. And if you're curious about the weeks after that, just scroll down. And we'll skip the list this week. Soccer today, Washington Park, uh, four to six. <laughs> I got it on a thumbs up. <laughs> from the powers that be. So uh, feel free to show up. Uh, you can play, watch. Uh, yeah. Uh, Washington Park at the end of Garland Avenue. I would point, but I would point the wrong way, so I will not. <laughs> See, I told you, I would do something like this. And that's not a good <laughs> If there's lightning storm, we might not be. If there's, so cool. if there's <laughs> lightning storm, it, it will not happen. All right, so our usual weekly activities. Uh, Wednesday is the uh, prayer time here in on this level of the building, usually back in that little room, starting at 1.30. So from 1.30 to 2.30, if you're someone who would like to be in prayer with some others, come and join the group. And another opportunity for prayer is on Thursday, starting at 12.30, uh, this group starts at the church and then walks throughout the community, praying for the community. Feel free to show up for that one. And of course, Friday is our busy uh, ministry day. And uh, if you're interested in volunteering, you can show up starting around 1030-ish. Uh, sometimes we can use volunteers inside, sometimes outside. And um, if you prefer to work or volunteer during a quieter time, uh, you can come to the church Tuesdays at 4 or Wednesdays at 10 and do some uh, volunteering. All right. We were scheduled originally this afternoon to, for the youth and their families to go swimming. Um, we have, based on weather forecasts, decided to postpone that. Um, it will probably... Uh, may or may not storm this afternoon, but even so, uh, the water has gotten pretty chilly in the pool over the last few days with the rains we have received and the, and the lower temperatures. And next weekend looks a lot warmer and drier. And so we're doing it <clears throat> next Sunday. Um, so we'll leave after church. Uh, uh, Sonia and Larry will feed us there for lunch and then we'll uh, swim. Uh, all uh, families with youth and kids are invited to see me if you if you haven't talked about it and I can uh, I will make sure everyone has information on how to get there. And um, I was going to say something else. Oh, and just because we're going to someone's house with a pool doesn't mean you have to swim. Okay, they have a they have a nice area there that you can sit a pool house that has a little overhang with some tables. You can sit there. They have the lounge chairs if you prefer to lay out in the sun. There's some other opportunities just to hang out and fellowship with one another. Um, you do not have to be in the pool. However, I personally like the pool. <laughs> I like swimming. Um, and this is another thank you. I thanked you last week um, for those of you who donated for the school supplies. And just one more thank you. Um, in case uh, you weren't here and didn't receive that, thank you. Now you have. Oh, before we do the offering. Um, you know, we've started these new bulletins again in the back. And this week's bulletin, if you don't miss it, there's a little piece of slip of paper in it. All right. Now, there, this is a, a uh, multi-purpose slip of paper. The most important for this week is the one that says the most important side, Christmas service preference. We're trying to figure out what, what 
what would be the get the most people here for a Christmas service? Would you prefer a Christmas Eve, 6 p.m., Christmas Day, 11 a.m., Christmas Day, 6 p.m.? We are asking you to mark anyone that you would attend, okay? So if there's only one of these three that you would even think about attending, then just mark one. But if you would attend any of them, no matter what day or time, mark all of them, okay? So we're trying to figure out when we can get the most people here. Because uh, just as the leadership team was talking, everyone had a different option. We said, okay, we need more. We need to know more information about other people. What's, what's uh, their preference? Now, so that's the side we are definitely looking for. And then you can place it in the offering plate as it, as it comes along. If you miss that, um, you can quickly walk it up to the offering plate after worship. On the other side is another opportunity if you so choose. We're just trying to collect information uh, from the people that come here and maybe we can get a director together um, of uh, information. So if you want to add some information about you and, and, and whoever else comes with you, feel free to write down uh, the names of you if you have children. Okay, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that I he didn't like that idea. Okay, Tim doesn't have to. Um, and address and phone number. You put down information you want. If you want to put nothing down, not even your name, that is okay. Okay, so again, that's in the bulletin. So if you don't have that now and later on, you want to go back to the bulletin and, and pick it up and then place it in the offering plate after worship. Again, our real goal today is for the Christmas survey, Christmas service survey. Hope I have not totally confused everyone. We move to our time of offering. Did you know? That what we have in our hands or pockets, our purses right now, is enough to overcome evil and feed the world. Ooh, you question that. Well, you know that five smooth stones were enough for David against Goliath. And another story from the scriptures, we know that five loaves of bread and two fish were enough to feed over 5,000. How is this? Well, that's because God increases them. So like children who know nothing belongs to them, who are eager to share, let us open our hands childlike before God and give what we do have. You may have financial resources to give. You may not have that, but you have a powerful prayer you would like to lift up to God silently during this time or write one down on a card that's in the back of the pew and place it in the offering plate. During the week, you may volunteer and give yourself that way. So think about what you do have during this time, whether it is something you're offering up physically today or throughout the week, We thank you. Let us pray for the offerings we're about to receive. Yeah. Oh God, as we bring our offerings, which are symbols of the power of this world, infuse in them the power of your world, the power of love. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In Jesus' name we pray. Would the ushers please come forward? To everything, turn, 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 there is 
There's a season, turn, 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 and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh. A time to weep. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to build up, a time to break down, a time to dance, a time to mourn, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time of love, a time of hate, a time of war, a time of peace, a time you may embrace, a time. Season turn, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to gain, a time to lose, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of. I swear it's not too late. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses one through ten. As for God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness. By the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love, we faithfully preach the truth, God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for the attack and the left hand for defense. 
We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, and we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we have spiritual riches to others. We have we own nothing, and yet we have everything. Amen. Well, well, well. I'm not again supposed to be the one to be here <laughs> this morning, but uh, the person who is supposed to is not able to come for some reasons, so I have to step in. Uh, our memory verse for this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. So we will, as we normally do, uh, um, mention the verse as well as recite uh, the words. So let's go. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For God said, at your the right time, I heard you. On, on the day, day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Let's go again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For God says, I shall have the right time in my heart. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today, Today is the day of salvation. salvation. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. I just remember many years ago, a long time really, and the way I know it's long is because I had hair. There were <laughs> lots of it then. Now, even if I use hair grow or one of those things <laughs> advertised on YouTube, it doesn't work for me. So when I had a lot of hair, I, where I was walking back home in Nigeria. And this night, I remember very well, I had lots, lots of friends in the Nigerian army. Uh, they would come to where I, I walk, would sit down and gist. And I used to preach to them quite a lot. I had traps, you know, um, um, that I give to them when they, make to, uh, when they come to make uh, their purchases. And I remember this night, one major came. He didn't come for anything, really. He just came to say hello to me. It was about 8 p.m. in the night. And, you know, we talked, and he told me, you, I'm traveling to Lagos, you know. I mean, yeah, it was about one and a half hours by plane. He said, I'm traveling on Friday. I'll be back on Monday, and then I'll see you when I return, just to say hello to you. And as he was saying that, I had this very deep impression in my heart that I should preach to him afresh. It was really very deep. I mean, I see him every time I know him, know his wife and all of that. And he said he was just going for two days. And I said to myself, well, he's going to come back. And then when he comes, we will talk more. He never came back because the plane crashed with about 50, 60 army officers, and that was it. And I've never forgotten that incident because the, the path from now to eternity, the rope that holds it is too thin that you are alive today, there's no guarantee that you're going to be alive in the next second. There is nobody who has that guarantee that as we leave the doors of this building, that we will all be alive. We don't have that. It's only God who, who, who has that. We just trust him and live by his word on a daily basis. So that, that, you know, that incident many years back has never left me. What of if I was the person that God was asking to talk to him 
for reconciliation before he passes to eternity. I don't know. I carried that guilt for a long time, you know, but after some time, I just told myself I had to move on. Now, so the Bible passage this morning reminds us that God at the right time has had us and he says, on the day of salvation, he has helped us. He says, indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Whatever challenge that God is putting into our hearts, into how we will walk with Christ, let us not delay it. Because we don't have a guarantee that we are going to have an opportunity to say yes to God. If God is prodding you, if God is telling you, you are far from me, you need to be closer to me, to my son, Jesus Christ. If God is saying to you, give your life to Jesus, give your life to, to my son. Now, don't say to God, yeah, well, tomorrow, you don't have tomorrow in your hands because you are not God. If God is saying to you, witness to somebody, tell somebody about Jesus. No, don't delay it. Because neither you nor the person knows anything about to know anything about tomorrow. And finally, uh, this morning also is the fact that you know, apart from salvation, that God says right now, now is the day of salvation. Every opportunity that we have to help others, we should not delay that opportunity. You see, when I sat down this morning, I remember growing up and it never left me. And, you know, it, it influenced the way I lived quite a lot. My father had this little write-up by a missionary on top of his table. And any time while young, you know, I just run, and all of us, you know, are the kids, we, we, I, I'm, I'm almost sure that all of us know this by heart. It says, I shall pass this way but once. Any good that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it. For I shall not pass this way again. Any opportunity we miss to bless others, to tell others about Christ, to help those in need, there's not going to be a, a reverse. We're not going to rewind, you know. We're not uh, a, 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 a people in a video sequence that we can rewind the sequence of events. God has given us this opportunity to be re reconciled to his son, to be reconciled to one another, and to be his eyes and ears and leg and all of that in this world. Let's not miss the opportunity to be Jesus this week. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, we uh, are continuing and we're kind of probably today is about the halfway mark for this sermon series on the uh, three uh, Solomonic books of wisdom. Uh, uh, we've got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. And we're, we're halfway through. We're in the middle of the three books. So these, these books are, uh, as we said, kind of like a ladder. And we're, we're past the four beginner stage of Proverbs, and we're into this kind of um, mature middle where there's kind of a crisis where you sort of realize all of a sudden as, you, as you've been living well, you've been living as the Proverbs indicate, but you also see that, well, boy, there are certain things that this doesn't fix, that sometimes you do the right thing and you get punished for it. Sometimes you tell the truth and nobody believes you. Sometimes you um, you see good people mistreated and the wicked prevailing on this earth. Sometimes certain things just don't get fixed, right? And so then what do you do? What do you do with that when you see that? And Ecclesiastes faces those hard truths. In general, Ecclesiastes is about accepting 
what you cannot change. <laughs> there's there's that serenity prayer that is a favor to those that uh, are uh, in uh, recovery, right? Uh, Lord, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but Lord, grant me the uh, the the courage to change what I can, the uh, serenity to accept what I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. I butchered it. It's a lot prettier if you actually you know read it out of a book. But Ecclesiastes, if Proverbs is sort of like, grant me the courage to change what I can, Ecclesiastes is sort of like, grant me the ability, the serenity to accept what I can. And uh, in fact, we're going to look at one particular passage, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 3. But before we go to that passage, this verse is kind of like the theme verse of the whole book, I think. Ecclesiastes 7.13. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? There's wisdom in that, in this wisdom book. We all lead rather crooked lives. And I do not here primarily mean morally crooked, although that is true too. We're all sinners. We all screw up. But I mean, in our lives, Nothing is ever just straight, simple A to B. I mean, not, not on the big scale, not with anything that matters, right? You can always expect, like, I mean, just you try to build a, an Ikea desk. And that's not going to be straight, simple A to B. I recently put together a bunk bed for my daughter, and that was not straight, simple A to B. I had to leave once to go get a kind of screw that I didn't have. I, and life is like that, right? Because we all end up having to do things we'd rather not do, right? I'm at point A. I want to get to point B. But lo and behold, before I can go to point B, I've got to take a detour and go to points B prime and C and D and E and F before I ever even get there, right? And that's a reality, right? You and I always have to do things that we'd rather not do and that we didn't plan on doing. Very infrequently do things just per go perfectly according to plan. And we have to experience things we'd rather not experience. I had a kidney stone that needed an operation, which I could not afford. And I spent the better part of five weeks, whenever that thing moved, vomiting and falling onto the floor and literally counting seconds. Like I could, I'd be like, I'll make it through the next 10 seconds. I can make it through the next 10 seconds and praying and crying until thank God a way to get that surgery appeared. And I was able to have it removed. I did not like experiencing that level of pain and that level of uncertainty and not knowing if I had to get out of a classroom or get out of my job, a job that I had to take the bus to because I had no car. And now I've got to take a bus ride that's going to take me an hour and a half to get back from my job where I can lay down on the floor until this pain passes. And some of you guys have way worse stories than my stories. Some of you have had way worse pains. You've experienced things you didn't want to experience. Your life looks like a jagged, jagged line. You're pursuing a goal and that goal gets delayed way past what you thought or it just gets denied. Speaking of denied goals, sometimes the story that you think you're telling, the story that you think is your life, get sidetracked or just blown up. You just realize that's not even the story. And I'll never get back to that story. I thought I was in this story. I'm not in that story. I don't know if I ever was. If I ever was, I'm not in it now. And I'm never going back to that story. And the thing is, every human life is like that. I know yours is like that. I know mine is like that. And the question is, what do we do with that crookedness? How do we relate to the fact that our lives don't go the way we would plan them if we could plan them perfectly? How do we relate to all the detours and all the sidetracked things and the times when the dream that we had blows up and where the story we thought we were telling falls apart irretrievably sometimes? You're just never going back to that story. What do you do? How do you relate to the crookedness in your life? Do you 
impatiently regard all that crookedness, all those detours and things as problems that you just work to solve. That if I work hard enough, I can hammer these crooked edges flat. Or do we patiently accept them as seasons that may have their own lessons to teach and their own purposes that will be unfolded? With these questions in mind, with Ecclesiastes 7.13, accept the way God does things, who can straighten what he has made crooked. With these things in mind, let us now read our main text, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 11. You will recognize it as what dear Judy Collins was singing over our offertory. For everything, there is a season. A time for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, the time to turn away, a time to search, and a time to quit searching, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I've seen the burden God has placed on all of us. Yet, God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Each of these seasons, we are told, is beautiful in its own time. Now it is easy to see and receive and accept and enjoy the beauty of some of these seasons. And it is hard and sometimes only after the fact that you can see the beauty of some of these seasons. I remember being around my grandma Michael's deathbed. My grandma Michael was mother to 13 children whom she kept fed and clothed, whom she drove around in a station wagon, sometimes far more of them in that station wagon than there were seatbelts for. This is back in the day when people didn't worry about that so much. And if there is a more loved person on earth, I, I she'd be in the running. Well, well loved and well deserved love for my grandma Michael. And that hurt immensely to watch her decline. Her, she had uh, I don't know if it was actually Alzheimer's, but she had dementia, and she did not know us by the end. But it almost didn't matter because in those very last days we had basically packed out her room at the hospice on Wilmington. 13 children, 13 marriages, 40-some grandchildren. I don't know how many great-grandchildren, quite a few by the time she passed, most of us local. And 
there was so much laughter in that room and so much sunlight coming in those big bay windows. It's a wonderful hospice facility there in Wilmington. It was a rare thing, I think, in that moment that as we sat around her deathbed, we could see in the moment, in the season of her death, that there was beauty in it, that there was goodness in it. Now, sometimes someone dies and it's not like that and we can't see it. But the startling thing that we are told here in Ecclesiastes is that every season does contain its own beauty. That doesn't mean everything that happens to you is good. That is not true. Sometimes this world, there are evil things, and that it is evil. Murder and, and abuse and, and deceit, these are evil things, and we endure them. And yet that somehow, even in the season of war, that there are, if you look in the right places, that God is not absent from that. He's somehow working and bringing something beautiful in the cracks that the evil opens up in the world. And, and, and so each season, each season is beautiful in its own way and it has its own beauty to be discovered. And then I, I love this line that God has set eternity in our hearts. Eternity is not long amounts of time. Eternity is timelessness. And so there's a contrast here. Our circumstances go up and down, up and down. And they're often very complex. Certain parts of my life are going well. Certain parts are terrible. But there is something eternal inside of me, something that is timeless, something that doesn't ever change, something that never goes away. And that is that part of me that was made to yearn for God, whose time it always is, in seasons of plenty and in seasons of want, in, in, in advantageous circumstances and in awful ones. God is present and he is near. And that is timelessly true. And he is the one, by being timelessly present, by being present in all times and all seasons, he imparts beauty to every season, even seasons that would not otherwise have anything redemptive in them. And the question that you may have at this point, though, about these different seasons and how we react to them, is, is how do I tell what season I'm in? Because that right, sometimes it's a time to gather things together, and sometimes it's a time to scatter. Sometimes it's a time to build up, and sometimes it's a time to tear down. Okay, well, that's I know that, you know that there are going to be things that are always true. We'll talk more about them in a minute. But, but how do I know? I mean, sometimes what screws us up, sometimes what troubles us, what keeps us up at night, is I don't know. Should I continue trying to build this thing up and work on this thing? Or do I just need to accept that it's a time to scatter it, to tear it down, to move on? How do I know? How can I tell? How can I tell whether I need to work at adjusting my circumstances or whether I need to work at adjusting myself to my circumstances, right? Is this problem that I'm facing the kind of thing where it's like, okay, God wants me to buckle up, buckle in, focus up, and work on this problem. Or I need to accept this is a limitation. This is a part of life. This is a season I'm in, and I need to work with the grain. I um, am watching a show right now called Alone. <laughs> Has anybody heard of this show? Susan, you've heard of it. Anybody else heard of Alone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm watching it right now. Now, in this show, I, I promise you this is going to connect. In this show, they take 10 people. The one I'm watching right now, they're all around on an island somewhere, each of them on their own island, the 10 contestants, on, on Reindeer Lake in Saskatchewan, way north, like right below the Arctic Circle. They drop you off. You have 10 tools that you select, that you bring with you, and you have to survive alone as long as you can. The last one... Uh, remaining because it's America and everything we do has to have a cash prize. Uh, and the last one remaining gets five hundred thousand dollars. 
but you don't know how long other people are lasting. You just survive on your own with 10 tools as long as you possibly can in a very inhospitable environment. These are not easy places to survive. There's no McDonald's nearby. There's no hospital nearby. You are eating berries, what you can catch, you know. And um, there are these two gentlemen, and I know the showrunners juxtaposed them on purpose. It was good editing. One was a young man. Uh, I think he's 26 years old. And he went out there with this battle attitude. I'm going to subdue this place. I'm a warrior. And, um, and, uh, and, and his plan was I'm going to catch big game and set myself up for the whole winter. And I'm going to last 100 days plus. And he kept at his plan and he kept at his plan. He, wa he wasn't really foraging. He, he, was, he had his plan. He had what he was going to do. And he was going to conquer the wilderness. He was going to catch a moose or something. He was going to set himself up. He lost like 50 pounds and he barely had any to begin with. They actually captured on camera the moment where he collapsed unconscious onto the ground, his GoPro camera running through the whole thing. He wakes up from having passed out and realizes I, I can't make it. I'm done. I, I risk permanent injury or death if I, if I continue. And he calls in and they tap out. They give him a satellite phone at any point. You can call in. You can go home. He did. He's a much older man who you get to, they kind of narrate their stories to you as they go. And he's suffered a lot. And this older man said, as he was fishing, because he he came and he thought through that'd be his, his preferred plan was he'd catch big game, set himself up, have plenty of food, smoke it, eat, eat well all winter. But the big game wasn't around. And so he said, okay, I'm going to do something different. He improvised a net, started trying to fish, started catching enough fish that he still lost 40 pounds himself, but he had enough to survive. And he said this thing last night, and I just thought it was really interesting. He said, you can't come out into a place like this and think you can fight nature and win. If you try to fight nature, you are always going to lose. You have to work with the place you're in. Work with nature. Adjust to it. You will not make it adjust to you. The editors were very wise to juxtapose those two men's attitudes. When are we being like that young man, insisting on our way, when what we need to do is adjust ourselves to the reality the unchangeable reality that we're in. And when, though, when do you need to work at something? Sometimes it is a season to gather, to build, to press, to persevere. One more shot and you'll get it. How do we know the difference? I don't have any, I think you, this is one of those things where you learn by experience how to tell the difference. And that experience is going to include the times you get it wrong <laughs> and you'll learn by getting it wrong and you'll learn to know. But I can maybe give you a, a tip, a, a rule of thumb. Ask yourself when you're in a season and you're not sure what season it is. Is it gathering or scattering? Do I need to keep working to build it up or do I need to accept it and move on? Where do you hear Jesus calling to you from? And then go that way. Now, this takes quiet and patience. It takes you stop and really consider and really ask yourself, not where do I want to go? But where does where is Jesus calling me from? Remember, he, he called out from a cross. In fact, very often, whatever is true, he is calling to us from a cross, and he's calling us to costly and painful love. In a season, he may be calling you actually deeper into something that is painful and difficult. My friend, my spouse, my significant other, my, you know, whoever it is, someone close to me is really, really in distress and struggling. And everything in me wants to run away and get peace and quiet for myself. Very likely what Christ is calling me to do in that moment 
is to draw closer to them, even though doing that hurts me too. I'm going to read you two poems that I think well capture the way that very often Christ calls us toward that which is difficult, to more deeply inhabit that which is painful, if it is a pain that comes from love. I've said this before, but love does not innately attach itself to pain. In the world to come, in the world to come, love will bear no pain. But in this broken world, to love is to open yourself up to pain, to the pain of loss, to the pain of misunderstanding, to the pain of rejection, to the, to the pain of sacrifice, because love in this broken world always entails sacrifice. And so if we're going to love, we're going to have pain. And yet that's precisely what we're called to. So let me, let me read you first by Mary Oliver. I read you one of her poems last time. This is another of hers. I like her a lot. This is Mary Oliver's poem, Row for Your Life. And it's as if she's addressing a young person trying to give advice. She wrote this as an old woman. She has passed away. Row for your life. You are young. So you know everything. You leap into the boat and begin rowing. But listen to me. Without fanfare. Without embarrassment. Without any doubt, I talk directly to you. Listen to me. Lift the oars from the water. Let your arms rest a minute and your heart and heart's little intelligence. And listen to me. There is life without love. It is not worth a bent penny or a scuffed shoe. It is not worth the body of a dead dog nine days unburied. When you hear a mile away and still out of sight, the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil, fretting around the sharp rocks, when you hear that unmistakable pounding, when you feel the mist on your mouth and sense ahead the embattlement, the long falls plunging and steaming, then row, row for your life toward it. the sweetest and best things that you will receive in this life will come from those moments when you do not run from the costs that love exacts. When you join Christ in carrying a cross, when you enter more deeply into the pain that comes from accompanying the people you love, then there comes in its own time and season a sweetness from that, which nothing on this earth can match. I've watched people run away from the deathbeds of loved ones because it was too painful to sit beside them. I've never seen someone glad after the fact that they did that. And I've watched people who, though it tore their heart out to sit at the deathbed of that loved one, they did it. And I've never seen them regret that later. Even though it can be hard to watch them because their face has been transformed by pain, disfigured in some way, and yet to sit there and to hold their hand, even though the hand is cold, even though... You recoil at the feeling of it. You decide, no, I will hold it and lend my warmth to that hand. And I'll touch the emaciated face and I'll kiss the gaunt cheek. A beauty settles upon such moments. Row toward them. Don't go away. Don't fear the rapids. Don't fear the, the embattlement, the, the falling and the, the tripping and the spray of that difficulty. Run toward it. Row toward it. Enter more fully into such pain. Pain is not a marker necessarily of something wrong. Pain can be a marker. Sometimes it is. But pain can be a marker of love. And that's why I'll read you one more. 
I went ahead and indulged myself and did two poems today. Last time I limited myself just to one, but I, I like poetry a lot. I get a lot out of it. And this is by Robert Frost, who's better known, I think, than Mary Oliver. Many of you will have read Robert Frost like in school at some point. This is To Earthward. And it has several insights, but one in particular about tears and what tears mean and their place in our life. You can listen for that. That's why I'm reading it. He begins by talking about like romantic love and the excitement of romantic love, but he, he moves on to talk about something more profound, a better kind of love. Love at the lips was touch as sweet as I could bear. And once that seemed too much, I lived on air that crossed me from sweet things the flow of, was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk? I had the swirl and ache from sprays of honeysuckle that when they're gathered shake dew on the knuckle. I crave strong sweets, but those seemed strong when I was young. The petal of the rose it was that stung. Now, no joy, but lack salt that is not dash with pain and weariness and fault. I crave the stain of tears, the aftermark of almost too much love, the sweet of bitter bark and burning clove. When stiff and sore and scarred, I take away my hand from leaning on it hard in grass and sand. The hurt is not enough. I long for weight and strength to feel the earth is rough to all my length. No joy is complete. It lacks salt if it is not dashed with pain, he says, with weariness and fault. In fact, he craves the stain of tears, the aftermark of almost too much love, because you never can have too much. Tears flow for different reasons, but one reason that tears flow from our eyes is when we love and loving lose. Loving have a parting at a deathbed. Loving have a parting uh, at college as we say goodbye to our child. Loving as we, um, there's many things that cause us because we love to cry. And what a blessing such a stain is. In fact, we crave it, don't we? We ought to crave it. Be bold enough to crave that. Be bold enough to crave that. And so, brothers and sisters, when you're discerning the season, when you're trying to figure out, do I need to keep pushing or do I need to let go? You ask yourself, where is Jesus calling to me from? Is this, maybe is this relationship that I am in, is this something abusive? And so Jesus is actually saying, stand on two feet. This is not love. This is some twisted counterfeit of love. Go, leave this. Leave it. Or is it something that is loving, but it has costs because it is love? And he's actually saying, you need to come deeper in. You're in the shallows. You actually need to be in the deep end on this. Come closer in, come deeper in. It's going to hurt more. But the hurt will be like salt that brings forth the true beauty of this love. You want the stain of tears here, brother, sister. and then live, and then fail, and then screw it up and learn from that. <laughs> you will. I don't, we, none of us will perfectly discern the season we're in, and we'll learn from our screw-ups. I'm going to wind our sermon down by taking us back to the reading that Linda did, because I want to remind us of what we were told in our memory verse and in the passage that Linda read, that and, and what, what Ecclesiastes 3 said, right? Here's all these seasons, but God has set eternity in our hearts. There are certain things that are timeless. There are certain things that are always true. Um, 
Whatever is going on, whatever season we're in, it is true that today is a season of salvation because in every season, the time to be born and the time to die, the time to build and the time to tear down, a time to gather and a time to scatter, all of them in every season, there is a path laid ahead of you that leads to greater wholeness and holiness. There is. In seasons of loss, the question is, how do I deal with this loss? There's a way of dealing with it that the Holy Spirit will help me with, that Jesus will walk me through, that in this loss, I can become a more whole and holy person. And in the season of plenty, there is a way to walk that leads me to callousness and disregard for the need around me, but there is also a, a way in the season of plenty that leads me to greater wholeness and holiness. In every season, today is the day of salvation. In every season, this is true because Jesus comes to us in every season. In every season, you are accompanied by Jesus Christ. If you are in a season of terrible pain and terrible loss, he is at your right hand. And he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You are not alone. In that season, Jesus is next to you, and he is what makes it beautiful in its own time. Having plenty without Jesus is not beautiful. Riches without Jesus, health without Jesus, without him, it's nothing. With him, it can be good. You can use it for good. You can thank him and praise him and be filled with gratitude. Without him, you'll be wondering why you don't have as much as the next person. Without him, your heart will never be satisfied. Without Jesus, when you are in seasons of distress and perplexity and confusion and loss, you can be crushed beneath the weight of it. But with Jesus... You will be hard-pressed, but you will not be abandoned. You can be pressed in on every side, but you won't be destroyed. In fact, Linda read it for us once, but I'm going to close by reading again what we are offered in every season. Whether those seasons of loss, I'm going to read the whole thing, but there's the, from the, the end of it, I think something it's good to take away. But let me read for us. In closing, afresh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Having already looked at verse 1, we're going to start at uh, 1 and 2. We're going to start at verse 3. This way of living, I'm at verse 3 of chapter 6, if you want to read with me. Um, I don't have it on the screen. You can look it up in the Bible in front of you. This way of living is for all seasons. The way that Paul is talking about you don't, you don't need to discern. Do I need to do this now? Here is a way of living that this much at least is always, always appropriate. This way of living with Jesus and for Jesus. So here's, here's a way to live that's always in season, brothers and sisters. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness. And that doesn't mean literal weapons. That means my weapon is my righteousness. My weapon is the truth. My weapon is love. My weapon is integrity. I use these weapons in the right hand for attack and the left for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us. Doesn't matter, right? Whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. 
We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. And now this verse I've put up there for us. This is, a, this is true in all seasons, I think. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We're poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing. And yet, we have everything. Brothers and sisters, our hearts ache. Sometimes they are rent open. Sometimes they feel like the blood is pooling on the ground ahead of us. But we have joy because we have Christ. It's not that I feel a certain way, feel happy because, oh, well, this much I have. Sometimes all we have is Christ, and yet he is our joy. He is that constant companion. He is that one who loves us un failing with a pure love that is brighter than the brightest sunlight that has ever fallen on your skin. That blows with a sweetness that is sweeter than the sweetest smelling honeysuckle you've ever smelled on the breeze. The sunshine of his love is always there. The sweetness of his presence is always there. We do not always smell it. We do not always see it. But in every season, he is present. And he makes it beautiful. And he gives us joy. And it is his voice that you ought to row toward whatever season you are in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to learn the season that we're in. Not to try to fight against nature, not to try to fight against the inevitable, not to struggle, Lord God, against that which ought not to be struggled against, but accept it. May we learn to live within those limitations our life has set. May we learn, Lord God, to work with the grain of the universe, not against it. Work with the grain of your intention, not to try to straighten what you have made crooked, But even in our crookedness, you are present. We welcome and thank you for being present in our crookedness, for writing something beautiful with the jagged lines of our lives, for setting eternity in our hearts. Help us live and do those things that are always in season. Help us work hard where you call us to it and to accept and sit with pain where you call us to it. In doing either, may the end result be that our hearts are made more beautiful, our lives more holy, in this world brought one step closer to your kingdom. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And I, I picked this song, and my, if choir members come forward and help, um, I picked this song to close with because in every season, this is one of those things, right? In a good season, the sweetness of leaning on Jesus, whew, it just makes it all the better. In a tough season, he is the one who gets you through. But no matter what, it is his arms we lean upon. It's his presence we count upon that lasts through every season. So we're going to sing this class. Mm -hmm. What a Leaning on the air, I'm 
Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I am going to send you out with this blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, and who ratified an eternal covenant mm -hmm. with his blood. Mm. May he equip you with all you need for doing his well. well. May he produce in you in every season, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to God forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.